at 12. The 6 o'clock news starts right now. A fitting location for a talk about new beginnings. City Council members gathered for their first full council meeting at the newly renovated City Hall today. As the city exits this pandemic, council members got more information on how they could put to work hundreds of millions of incoming federal dollars from the American Rescue Plan. Our Garrett Berger joins us live now with the latest. He's covering this one for us today. So Garrett, how much is the city actually getting? Well, in all, the city expects to receive about almost $466 million through ARPA. That's the American Rescue Plan Act. It's a lot, but most of it, about $327 million, is specifically for the city's recovery efforts. That's a lot of money, and there are a lot of ideas on how to use it. That $327 million pot of money can be used to replace lost revenue, but also things as varied as providing extra pay to essential workers or improving mental health and substance abuse programs. Mayor Ron Nuremberg commented that this is a, an incredible and unique opportunity to use the ARPA dollars as a catalyst for transformative changes. And council members asked about using the money for issues such as improving city buildings, repairing pipes, and making up for delayed street maintenance. City Manager Eric Walsh said this is just the council's first conversation and he expects more of them and potentially partnering with the county, which is getting its own chunk of federal dollars to leverage that money. Remember, we have, this is very different than last year, we'll have until 2026 to spend these funds. And so what, I've, what I'm recommending to the council is that our financial plan be built over that three to five year period. We're gonna to need to continue to monitor it. But I mean, you heard today, there are a lot of things that, that are potential. The longer term plans will be phase two though, Walsh said. First, the city's focusing on getting its finances stable, recovering lost revenue, and addressing immediate problems. Now, the guidelines for how to use this money aren't set yet, and the city has until mid-July to get in comments on what might need to be changed. And Walsh said they'll be making some assumptions when they present the city council with a trial budget two weeks from now. Live at City Hall, I'm Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. All right, thank you, Garrett. A bipartisan delegation of congressmen and senators today were in the Rio Grande Valley. They saw where undocumented immigrants, including families and children, have been detained during the surge at the border. Their visit comes after Governor Greg Abbott issued a disaster declaration for border counties. Some people call it a crisis. Uh, some people call it a disaster. Um, the fact of the matter is our local border communities are overwhelmed. Senator John Cornyn there, along with Congressman Henry Cuellar and Tony Gonzalez, and Arizona Senator Kristen Sinema, a mix of Republicans and Democrats, the four are promoting the Bipartisan Border Solutions Act. They say if adopted, it includes added resources for agencies and border communities dealing with the recent surge of the arrivals at the border. New at six facing arson charges for burning down his home and setting his neighbor's vehicle on fire. An autistic man back in court this morning. Not on those charges, but on the conditions of his release. Eric Hernandez with why his family and attorneys say he should not be wearing an ankle monitor. Now, several witnesses spoke in this hearing today for Eric Hernandez, who's also referred to as Fox. Hernandez, who has epilepsy and autism, was in court with his father, who is his caregiver. The defense argued that the monitor was not necessary as Hernandez is supervised by his father. He doesn't understand why he has to wear it. He doesn't understand what it's for. And so what we were presenting to the judge, we were asking her to take it off uh, because really the concern is that Fox might start another fire and this GPS location monitor does nothing to prevent him from doing that. The Leon Valley Fire Chief was a witness for the state and was is concerned for the public's safety since Hernandez and his father are living in a hotel right now and he could possibly set another fire. Now, after hearing both sides, Judge Velia Mesa denied removal of the tracker but did modify restrictions. I won't remove it today. I'm going to help you with the fees. I'm going to help you by uh, removing the restrictions, but he's still going to be monitored. It's a step in the right direction for what's best for Fox and the community. Mesa will again review this case in 30 days to see if those new modifications are working. Now, it's also worth noting that Fox has yet to be indicted in this case. At the Cadenaries Justice Center, Eric Hernandez, KSAT 12 News. No justice, no peace. No justice, no peace. 
More than two years later, when the friends and family of local cyclist Tito Bradshaw still waiting for justice to be served. Today, a group of bicycle safety and Bradshaw supporters were outside the Bear County Courthouse demanding that justice, not only for Bradshaw, but other cyclists killed while riding. Linda Collier Mason was charged with intoxication manslaughter for hitting and killing Bradshaw while on his bike. Bring awareness to bicycle safety for everybody. We want justice for Tito. We want his name remembered. Attorneys from both parties met today to discuss this case. This marks the first day that case moved to the 379th District Court following a recusal by the previous judge. San Antonio police hoping for some help from the public will help them catch up to a man they say set a woman's car on fire last month. This happened at the Gillette Square Apartments back on May 3rd. That's on the south side of the city near Commercial Avenue. Officers say early that morning the suspect poured some sort of flammable liquid over that vehicle and tried to set it on fire. Anyone with any information on who this is in these images has to call Crime Stoppers. That number is 210-224-STOP. It is a boat sized donation because it literally is a boat. It's going to be operated by the Bear County Sheriff's Office. The donation, thanks to Black Rifle Coffee. They spent weeks raising money to donate a check to be used to purchase a boat for the Bear County Sheriff's Department. The boat will be useful for things like water rescues and searches. The co founder says BCSO needs proper equipment to best serve the community. And just like this boat, if we can provide them resources, the great men and women of the law enforcement and the sheriff's department are actually able to conduct their job in a far more successful manner. And, and at the end of the day, the people that benefit from that are, is the community and the community's health and well-being. BCSO also had recently received a donation of canine vests for their canine units at no cost to taxpayers. Think about how many lights are in your home or at a grocery store or in your office. What if they could kill COVID-19? It's a new idea that could be an untapped resource for a more sanitized future. Ursula Perry with details on the first place in the country to put COVID killing tech in their lights. From nanoparticles to robots, new innovative tech has been saving lives through the pandemic. And now the med spa Glow Aesthetics is the first location in the country to install COVID killing UVA lights in their ceilings. It felt really exciting to be the first in the country to have these. The lights have two modes that emit different wavelengths from the invisible ultraviolet spectrum. Mode one is UVA, continuously and safely offering virus protection throughout the day. Eight hours under these lights is the equivalent of one minute in the sunlight. Mode two is UVC, a powerful wave with the ability to kill viruses in the air and on surfaces, including the flu, E. coli, mold, and COVID-19 too. Do you just basically go into the room? It has a QR code that you match up to it, and within five minutes, the room's clean. But if it can kill COVID, can it kill you too? These UVC lights have emergency shutoffs to protect users from overexposure. This is just like an extra step that's ensuring us like no matter what, there will be no germs left behind. The opportunities for these lights is endless, potentially anywhere that uses lighting. Universities, schools, retail stores, offices, street lights. You could even put them inside cars that are used for ride sharing opportunities. And why not movie theaters? The UVC light can even be used once everyone has left the room. Ursula Perry, KSAT 12 News. Look outside with live cam this evening. A little bit of a gray picture here. We have seen some sunshine, but now we're wondering about that rain that is yet to come in the days ahead. Adam Caskey is going to have an update on that straight ahead. The news around Texas, a suspect in custody in southeast Texas in connection with a missing child case out of Houston. The arrest made after the child's body found in a motel room in Jasper. Police in Houston say they believe the body is that of Samuel Olson. He was reported missing last week by his father's girlfriend who told police the boy's mother took him. Police do not think that's true. They arrested the girlfriend at that motel. Evidence tampering charges are expected to be filed against her. 
Two big busts by Border Patrol in South Texas, taking hard nar narcotics out of the hands of would-be smugglers, trying to bring the drugs into Texas. This was the first one. Border Patrol agents say almost 170 pounds of meth had been hidden in a car being driven across the Juarez-Lincoln Bridge. The drugs and car were seized by Border Patrol and the driver, a 29-year-old U.S. citizen, was arrested. The same day, same bridge. This time it was cocaine, more than 21 pounds of it. Officers say it was hidden in a pickup truck driven by a 23 year old man from the United States. Border Patrol got the truck and the drugs. The driver arrested more than $3.5 million worth of drugs seized in these two cases alone. In our traffic authority coverage today, a project underway to improve the connection between one of San Antonio's oldest neighborhoods and the heart of our city. That work aims to restore the link between the city's west side and downtown. Samuel King joins us now. Samuel, this isn't just about roads that we're talking about. And you know, Steve and Myra, it includes public art, new sidewalks, bike lanes, and for some in the area, it's another sign of more investment in a place where an infrastructure has often been neglected. Sometimes building a bridge isn't enough to connect one community to another. It's been a kind of a connection, disconnection, connection, disconnection. Gabriel Velasquez is president of the Avenida Guadalupe Association. He says the West Side hasn't always seen the investment it needs, despite its proximity to downtown. We're very excited about being reconnected, right? Back historically, the highway uh, disconnected the West Side from the West Side of downtown. And then, of course, historically, the, the train, all of those things uh, were impediments. This latest project is a sign that's changing. The city is beautifying the commerce, Buena Vista and Guadalupe bridges. City crews have begun work to paint the underpass columns with hues found throughout the west side at sunrise, sunset, and of the Virgin Guadalupe's tilma, or cloak. It's part of the project to create the Zona Cultural District between Main Plaza and South Salado Street, adding widened sidewalks, gathering spaces, and new bike lanes. The work was supposed to be only focused on the Commerce Street corridor, but Councilwoman Shirley Gonzalez's office found funding to expand it to the Buena Vista and Guadalupe bridges. It encourages people to come explore what's here on the west side, uh, our arts community, our restaurants, uh, and of course the wonderful people that have lived here on the west side for generations. A sign of change some say is long overdue. It seems that uh, uh, we're, we're really dealing with the proactive efforts to make sure that the west side is not a segregated piece of, of, uh, of the city. And that color palette was developed by San Antonio-based artist Rubio. The entire project, all three bridges set to be completed in 2023. Traffic is busy downtown and busy in other parts of the area as we take a look at things. Some major issues I want to show you, though, on the southeast side right now. This is Loop 410 approaching 37. Had an earlier crash, but those slowdowns still remain six uh, miles per hour there. This uh, delay stretches all the way back to Rigsby, so that's about five miles. And here's what that's doing to your travel time there. Looking at about 40 minutes to get from 35 to 37, only 13 minutes the other way. Also, folks, we have a crash here northbound 35 at O'Connor. That is causing some slowdowns. But once you get to a top of line, it looks a little bit better. Here's 410 at Cherry Ridge. Also, some delays, Stephen Meyer. Thank you, Samuel. Let's go to Woodlawn Lake right now. Look at that picture from Sky 12. It is a scenic view to be taking in the lake, getting a nice walk in or a jog this afternoon, but it's all about the timing over these next couple of days, <laughs> when it's going to be a good time to be outside and when it's not. And, and you know, there's been times in June, by June 2nd, where things have started to brown up. So it's oh, good to see yeah. all that green grass out by Woodlawn Park, too. That's what I was thinking. I said just the grass and everything was yeah. perfectly green. And we're going to really add to our damp soil. We're going to add to it here. Slight chance tonight, better chances the next couple of days. So let's get right to it. Start with this evening. I do think we'll have some hill country storms in the hours ahead through about 10 o'clock. Odds are they'll weaken as they move towards San Antonio, but we could still get clipped by a few leftover showers and storms later tonight. So let's talk about it. You look at the radar right now. We had some activity along the Gulf Coast and the coastal plain even a few hours ago. Hallettsville, Lavaca County, down toward Victoria, had some pop-up 
heavy rain, little bit of lightning and thunder. And actually, to be honest with you, I was anticipating some activity to pop up around San Antonio. The problem is we need that energy from the sun. You need that daytime heating to destabilize the atmosphere. And look what happened with these high thin clouds move in those cirrus clouds and then they even shut off the development of those cumulus. So usually you see those puffy cumulus get a little taller into the afternoon and then they can turn into a shower. Well, that was what we were anticipating, but then those high cirrus clouds basically shaded us enough and even got rid of those puffy clouds. But we have an outflow boundary near San Angelo that's set up earlier today, and that's an outflow boundary from a previous thunderstorm complex in North Texas that is now activating some showers and storms. We've had a little bit of severe weather with it. There is this severe thunderstorm watch box, including Midland and San Angelo, but nowhere within the case at 12 viewing area. This is what we're watching for this evening and tonight as it pushes southward and overall you see more activity in New Mexico. We're going to monitor which could come together in West Texas and then move our way as we get into tomorrow. So it's one of those erratic weather patterns where you just have to stay on top of it and it changes hour by hour. We've got some disturbances aloft as well that are helping us out in terms of generating those showers and storms. I don't love the future casts and the high res computer models these days, but I think this one really has the best representation of all of them. And notice how eight o'clock we get some of that activity drifting down into the hill country, likely weakening a bit and then maybe clipping parts of San Antonio, especially the I-35 corridor and parts of I-10 east of town. Then we shift our focus to what could come together in New Mexico and West Texas overnight tonight, move towards San Angelo before sunrise, and then right after the morning commute is when we'd anticipate some of this complex, that thunderstorm complex to move into the San Antonio area and give us some uh, fairly scattered to widespread showers and storms. So that would be late morning into the afternoon tomorrow with the potential for some pockets of heavy rainfall. Storm chances are high. I mean, we're looking at 60% Thursday, Friday and Saturday. That does not imply that it's going to be raining all day. Those days just will have those periods of those thunderstorms and those complexes coming together and moving through town. Today we topped out at 86. It's below average. Average is 91. We're nowhere near that. And with those extra clouds today and then even tomorrow, we're going to stay below average. We're thinking so you look at the dew points well into the 60s near 70 feel some humidity out there. Catula only 92 Del Rio 90 Laredo 90. I usually point out those locations because they're typically the hot spots and right now. They're really not all that hot. All things considered this time of year. Divine is at 90 83 in Bulverde and Comfort Kerrville. You're 82. So tomorrow a 30% chance at sunrise and for the morning commute. We've offset and pushed those storm chances back just a few hours. We're thinking nine or I should say 10 11 a.m. especially noon on through the afternoon late morning into the afternoon. The best chance of the showers and thunderstorms tomorrow. In turn, temperatures pretty much in the 70s all day long. Then we get into Friday, Friday night and Saturday. Periods of those showers and storms developing heavy downpours at times. And really my primary concern here uh, tomorrow and all the way into the weekend is flash flooding more than anything. I think that the hail threat is pretty low and the wind threat is pretty low. Flash flooding, saturated soil. We could have some issues. All right. Thanks to watch. Thanks, Adam. All right. A lot of people are playing baseball and softball locally still still in the hunt for a state championship. Yeah, and we have one 6A area baseball team left, and that is the Smithson Valley Rangers. They are all set for the 6A regional final. They got a huge send off from the school today and former UTSA head football coach Larry Coker could get his call to the hall coming up. With family and friends weighing them on, the Smithson Valley baseball team departed Spring Branch today looking to continue their playoff run in big board sports. The Rangers were showered with much love this morning ahead of their 11 a.m. departure for Corpus Christi. From the moment they left the field house to board their charter bus, family and friends gave the Rangers a fantastic send off ahead of their Class 6A regional final showdown with Los Fresnos tomorrow. School is out, but the Rangers are still playing ball after sweeping Eagle Pass in the 6A state regional semis and after knocking out the mighty Reagan Rattlers two games to one in round three. Now the Rangers will take on the Falcons in a one game playoff in the Rangers first regional final since 2005. Winner advances to state.
It's a special moment. I mean, there's no there's no other way that I'd want to start off my summer than to be playing high school baseball right now, and especially being able to go to Corpus right now and miss out on summer vacations. It's just what I've been living for my whole high school career. Well, the moment is definitely there. You know, we did have some tough series, but we did pull through. You know, that's a team like this. We always have momentum going in, and we always have momentum going out. So that's how it is. Uh, we know that, I mean, they play one games every series in playoffs for the most part, and they have one pitcher who's been locking it down for them, and we know we're going to face him, so we got to be prepared for that. And that ace pitcher is Falcons lefty Victor Loa. Smithson Valley will play Los Fresnos tomorrow, 4 p.m. from Cabinets Complex in Corpus. Turning to high school softball, the Jets and Rockets are hard at work preparing for the Class 6A state semifinals and a matchup with the Rockwall Lady Yellow Jackets from the Dallas area. At 34 and 2, the Rockets are having a great season and they've showed a lot of heart and mental strength while overcoming numerous rain delays, sight changes, and early deficits in playoff series against O'Connor and Austin Bowie. Jutson, Judson Jr. right fielder Jada Leal is ready to play ball Friday with her teammates. Um, it's really exciting. We've never done it before, so being with my girls is just really exciting, and we're expecting to go come home with the wins. I expect this to be a tough ride. It's not going to be as easy as we might want it to be. It's going to be real tough. The Rockets will face Rockwall in the one-game playoff Friday, 4 p.m. from McCombs Field in Austin. In the Class 1A state final, defending champion DeHennis played Dodd City at McCombs Field today, and Dodd City takes it 8-4. to DeHennis' bid for back-to-back -back state crowns comes up short. Consistent with the policies of the city of San Antonio and the Alamo Dome, UTSA football will return to 100% capacity at the Alamo Dome. Plus, social distancing protocols will be lifted and tailgating will be permitted in the parking lots beginning with the 2021 season. Season tickets for the Roadrunners 2021 home schedule are now on sale. They will host Lamar in the home opener at 5 p.m. on Saturday, September 11th, one of six home games for the Roadrunners. And former UTSA head football coach Larry Coker is one of seven coaches named to the 2022 ballot for induction into the College Football Hall of Fame. He was hired in March of 2009 to start the UTSA football program from scratch. He spent five seasons with UTSA, guiding them as an FCS independent into the WAC and finally Conference USA. Coker was the head coach at Miami, Florida from 2001 through 2006, winning the national title in 2001. Guys. Good luck to Coach Coker. By the way, you also caught my attention with the tailgating. <laughs> the tailgating. Yeah, I'm yeah. just saying. A lot, a lot of, of fans, you know, are ready for that one. Yeah, I think I saw Caskey. He yeah. did? He's like, what? He was like, yeah, <laughs> tailgating. <laughs> Our case at Q&A is up next. It is Pride Month in San Antonio and across the nation, and that is some of the focus of our KSAT live stream coming up in just about a half hour uh, after this newscast wraps up. So as part of a preview, we're kicking things off here during our Q&A with Trinity Professor Amy Stone, who teaches in the Department of Sociology and Anthropology, to talk to us about Pride, its significance, and uh, so many of the struggles and the fights for equality within the LGBTQ plus community. Amy, thank you for being here with us today. Let's start with what is Pride? A lot of people think they may have an idea, but give us a better understanding of what this month is meant to commemorate. So Pride began as um, something called the Stonewall Riots, which was um, at the time in the 1960s in New York City, uh, bars were run by the mafia and often invaded by the police uh, who would basically drag everyone out, arrest them and um, cause a big scene. And so what Pride was, was it was a, a day that gay and lesbian and transgender people fought back. Um, so it started three nights of rioting and it began kind of a new way of being a gay person in the US. Um, one that centered coming out um, as a way of being um, open and visible and um, valued in the community. And Pride began as a way to really think about the ways that LGBTQ people are um, loved and valued and um, belong in the communities that they live in. Have you seen the, I mean, obviously there's been an evolution from what happened at Stonewall mm -hmm. to where we are today. It's been a sometimes painful evolution. And what I what I hope that we can provide with the live stream that comes up at seven o'clock that E.C. Romero and I will be hosting is 
make it a safe space where there's no dumb questions. I mean, you can ask basically anything that you want. And I think there are a lot of people that that when if, if you don't mind me using you as an example, your pronouns, you prefer they, them, their. Talk about why you prefer those pronouns and why pronouns have become something that people have put on their Twitter handle. They put on their bio. They put on their Facebook all over. Pronouns are a way of saying, this is the gender that I see you as, right? So when we call someone she or him or they, we're saying, this is the gender that I recognize you as. I see that you're a woman. I see that you're a man. I see that you're somebody who's maybe non-binary. Maybe you don't um, think of yourself as associated with being a man or being a woman. And so for me, when I use they, it's a way of saying that mm, I'd just rather not be associated with being a man or a woman. So when other people call me they, they're telling me, hey, I see you and I recognize you. Um, and I believe you, I believe your identity. Um, it's, it's a way that we signal every single day when we talk to each other, that we see each other's gender and we believe each other's gender. And that's part of why it's so important to um, tell other people what our pronouns are. Because one thing that's very painful for people who are transgender or non-binary is to be um, recognized as a different gender than what they are. So to be called a pronoun that they are not, right? So if they feel really deeply and, and identify as a woman and then be called he all day long, right? That's exhausting and painful. So what's your advice to people who are trying to educate themselves? Because so much of pride is about awareness and us all expanding our knowledge about uh, other people's uh, identities, how they would like to be addressed. But there's also that hesitancy of people just not wanting to offend someone else and not being knowledgeable enough to know how to proceed in conversations. And some people, like Steve mentioned, might feel like it's a dumb question or something I shouldn't ask. So what's your advice to somebody who isn't just quite sure uh, what terminology to be using? It's very normal to feel nervous about a topic that you feel like you don't know a lot about, right? That's a very normal thing. What I encourage my students to do is to first kind of try to seek out a little information on their own, right? The internet is there for you. Uh, there's also great books out there, but a lot of shorter things, particularly on um, websites of LGBTQ organizations, um, like uh, the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force, for example, or our own Pride Center, San Antonio, has some great links. So these are some really great places you can go to get information. And that's a really great place to start. Another great place to start is to kind of talk to the people around you in your life. There may be some other people in your life who know more about this topic um, and may be able to answer some of your questions. Yeah, just having a conversation oftentimes breaks down so many barriers. And that's why I'm really, really excited about not only the conversation we're having now, but the one we will have live stream. And Robert Salcedo from the Pride Center of San Antonio will also be joining us along with E.C.'s uh, Romero. I, I want to talk about, while we have a chance here, to talk about the study that you're doing right now. You've written a book on corneation, which is a huge fiesta celebration. You're doing research right now, as I understand it, about how these festivals can lead to cultural citizenship. Talk a little bit about that. My approach to looking at corneation as part of Fiesta San Antonio or um, these huge gay balls that I went to in Mardi Gras in Mobile, Alabama, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, is that when we have an event like Fiesta, it's a way of saying the whole city comes together. The whole city comes to celebrate, right? And when LGBTQ people are visible and included in those events, when, they, when their art is appreciated in some events, then it helps them become part of the city. It helps them belong in city spaces. And that's what I'm really interested in in this book that I have coming out next year. Can you tell us what cultural citizenship is? That's a, that's a term that I'm really very curious about. Usually when we think of citizenship, we think of like a passport, right? Like you belong in a certain country. But to belong in a country is much more complicated than just having a passport. Um, it's about your culture being valued, your culture being considered a positive thing, um, something that adds to the larger community. And so cultural citizenship is describing just that, that your group's culture is considered to be a value and an important part of the community.
Professor Amy Stone from Trinity University, part of our discussion coming up at the top of the hour at 7 o'clock. Appreciate your time for this Q&A, and uh, we'll see you in about 22 minutes. Thanks so much. Take care. We'll be right back. Welcome back, everybody. Have some lingering issues out there this uh, half hour. Taking a look at uh, the area, you see there's a lot of icons on the map. So I'll give you a closer look here at the wall. We start here, a newer crash. This is 90 westbound approaching Couples Road. You can see that backup extends all the way to I-35. Taking to the southwest side, this is getting a little better here, but we still have a major slowdown on 410 on the southeast side approaching I-37. Still have some backed up traffic there. And let's take you to the northeast side now, northbound 35 at O'Connor Road, still reports of a crash, still some major delays. And we have this one here, 1604 at Hausman Road. This is starting to clear up a little bit, but you can still see uh, police out there. They're looking at a vehicle. An ambulance was there, just left the scene there. So that's causing some delays. And remember, folks, here is some construction tonight uh, in this area, some alternating closures of the ramp here at 1604 at Hausman, heading eastbound. Guys, over to you. All right, thanks, Samuel. Look outside with live cam. Of course, we see some sunshine out there right now. Something that always affects the roads, rain. And we've got more of it in the forecast, Adam. Yes, it's a very active but challenging weather pattern that we're going to talk more about here coming up in a little bit as we do have increasing storm chances in the days ahead and even hours ahead for some people. So we'll break it all down for you in detail coming right up. Coachella is making a comeback. The Coachella Valley Music and Arts Festival will be held April 15th through the 17th, as well as the 22nd through the 24th of next year. Coachella has been postponed or canceled several times throughout the pandemic. Advanced ticket sales for the 2022 festival start June 4th. The lineup of musical acts has not yet been announced. Last month, organizers behind Lollapalooza, Chicago's largest music festival, announced it would be back this summer. COVID-19 vaccinations or negative tests will be required for people attending. Mm. Well, today the spotlight goes to one of our nation's favorite grab and go foods. It is National Rotisserie Chicken Day. <laughs> The commentary has already started, you guys. Rotisserie chicken is cooked on a spit, continuously turning as it cooks. The slow roasting sears the skin to seal in the flavor, resulting in that tender and juicy meat. Once major chains figured out a way to cook a bunch of them at once, they flew off the shelves. <laughs> but don't change. Yeah, National Rotisserie Chicken Day started by Boston Market Restaurants back in 2015. According to nationaldaycalendar.com, it was to celebrate the delicious dish and more than likely to try to sell some more. Shocking. A lot of grumbling coming from the weather department. Oh, it was we, a commercial. We haven't done a national day in a long time. Bummer. It was a commercialized national day? That's your favorite one. No. Started yeah. by hey. a business Shocking. to promote something? Oh, my goodness. Well, now you know. <laughs> there's probably four of them, one every quarter, to boost their sales, right? Well, there's the original, there's herb roasted, there's... Oh, Italian. boy, here we go, you're right. Yeah. Thank you, Claudia, <laughs> Italian. Organic. <sighs> Lemon pepper. Lemon pepper, <laughs> Man, says just Claudia. Claudia. Claudia, Claudia, Claudia wow. from she production. Claudia from production. She is more than just a teleprompter operator. Yeah, this is great. <laughs> I, I've got a feeling while I'm doing the forecast over there, she's just going to keep spinning yeah. off to you guys as well. Yes. More storms are, are likely in the hours ahead in the hill country, days ahead elsewhere. Some heavy downpours is what I'm really anticipating. A lot of moisture both here at the ground and especially upstairs, and that's going to lead to some heavy rainers. And the aquifer, I love to just put this in there every day. It's up 21.6 feet now since April 21st. I love keeping that running tally. Take a look at our radar over the past three hours. We had some activity in Lavaca County earlier a few hours ago and even along well, basically the coastal bend as well. Just west of Corpus Christi, some action near Austin that's popping up. There's this outflow boundary that uh, Sarah was talking about earlier today, especially during the noon show to watch for some activity developing this evening. Well, it has activated and now we have some showers and storms along that closer to San Angelo. And the anticipation is that some of this is going to come together and drift southward and clip parts of the hill country in the coming hours and then most likely dissipate as it 
as it approaches San Antonio tonight around 10, 11 p.m. Of course, we'll watch it because it, there's the chance that we could still get some pockets of heavy rain here and there, even close to San Antonio. It's nice to see the activity in West Texas. That's where we need the rain the most, and they're getting some of it. Fort Davis actually just uh, recorded three quarters of an inch of rainfall just over the past few hours. So that's good for them. And we'll have the newest drought monitor tomorrow. Yeah, we'll take a look at that and let you know what kind of nice changes we have there. Wiping away that drought, just erasing it. It's nice. OK, back to what we have now near San Angelo. We've got those thunderstorms that have developed right now. Nothing severe, but we're tracking that as it pushes southward in the coming hours, clipping parts of the hill country, especially uh, basically from Kerr County, Bandera County and points eastward. And there's the chance that we could still have some left over to clip parts of San Antonio with a few showers later tonight, anytime between about 10 p.m. and midnight. But odds favor it weakening as it moves our way. Then the focus shifts for the rest of the night into New Mexico and West Texas as a complex is likely to come together and then move our way and then we could get that late morning through the afternoon tomorrow. And I think this is the most likely scenario in terms of some more widespread rain tomorrow for the period of time late morning through the afternoon and then tapering off by the evening hours and moving on out of here. So you see high storm chances Thursday, Friday, Saturday. We've got them 60. There will be times they're probably 70, 80 percent. But the key is here. It doesn't mean it's going to wash out the entire day. Thursday, Friday and Saturday. It's going to be periods of that moving through with heavy rainfall likely 85. Now dew point is 65 southwesterly wind at five. Not too hot. We have decent amount of clouds, especially those high clouds moving overhead today. And so most of us are in the 80s this evening. A few hill country showers and storms and then a slight chance here in San Antonio around 10 11 PM tomorrow 7 AM 30% chance, but then we boost it up to 60% by late morning through the afternoon. And as a result of the timing of it, temperatures should really just be held in the 70s throughout the day tomorrow with a light southeasterly breeze. Flash flooding, I think, is the primary threat tomorrow and especially Friday into Saturday. Some heavy rain setting up, even more moisture in our atmosphere to be wrung out by those showers and storms. So periodically Friday and Saturday, we got to watch for flash flooding with those bouts of downpours. You know, I'm going to confess when we did the Lollapalooza story, I was wishing it was Thursday so we could call it their mama palooza. <laughs> well, tomorrow is Thursday, and I know you will not forget about that. I just, well, I just want to make Caskey smile over there. Now he's, <laughs> now he's got it thinking. It's, you know, oh yeah, my, my gears are turning. His brain is turning like a rotisserie chicken. Uh, right and now. Circle back <laughs> in case pepper. you missed it. Coming up next. <laughs> It's Wednesday, June 2nd. Right now, San Antonio police are looking for a 15 year old who hasn't been seen in more than two weeks. Her name is Alyssa Cantu. They say that she was in the state's custody when she ran away on May 15th. Investigators believe she may have gone to Houston temporarily. A caseworker says there is a chance she is back in San Antonio, though. SAPD says Alyssa has a medical condition and requires medication. If you see her or you know where she is, contact SAPD at 210 20 a body found in an East Texas motel believed to be that of a six year old boy who was reported missing almost a week ago. Samuel Olson disappeared May 27th. The medical examiner currently working to identify the remains found. Teresa Balboa, the girlfriend of the child's father, being charged with tampering with evidence after that body was found. She's currently in the Jasper County Jail and may face additional charges. Tesla recalling thousands of its Model 3 and Model Y vehicles. They could have loose brake connections. The caliper bolts could lead to the loss of tire pressure. They proactively fix the caliper bolts in new vehicles that are currently being assembled. The medical center on the south side, now a teaching hospital. The ultimate goal is improve access to health care in our community. It's now affiliated with the University of Incarnate Word School of Osteopathic Medicine and WellMed. With this partnership, the hope is to increase access to doctors all across San Antonio, including the south side.
All right, folks, still watching this situation 1604 at Houseman on the northwest side. Here's a look at that on Trans Guide. That ramp still closed off. Law enforcement still on the scene. Traffic being diverted. So if you're driving in that area, just watch out for that, Myra. All right, thanks, Samuel. And thank you for watching the news at 6. For now, we're going to turn things over to Stephen Isis, who are in our newsroom, gearing up for the live stream that starts in just a few minutes. Guys? Thank you, Myra. And uh, June is Pride Month, and a lot of times conversations lead to understanding, leading to breaking down stereotypes. And that's what we hope. This is a safe space tonight. This live stream that begins at 7 o'clock on KSAT.com and KSAT TV. And we are looking forward to a fascinating conversation the next hour. We're going to talk a little bit about the history of Pride Month, the way it has evolved over the years, and of course, why it is celebrated across the nation. And we certainly invite you to take part in that conversation. We are accepting questions. Just go to KSAT.com to join us. Yeah, Dr. Amy Stone and Robert Salcedo, Dr. Amy Stone from Trinity University and Robert Salcedo from the Pride Center here in San Antonio. We'll be taking your questions along with EC Sinai's questions tonight. You can join in the conversation. We hope you do. Like I said, it's a safe space where there's no such thing as a dumb question. And I like those kind of conversations. So we'll see you on KSAT.com and the KSAT TV app.